this is something we all need to understand is really important. And if we don't want to be erased from history, not only do we need to make sure that we save our history, but also that it gets somewhere that we'll be able to take care of it in perpetuity. Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. When it comes to someone like Lisbeth Tellefson, the answer is always D, all of the above. She's a collector, a curator, a community activist, a child of the San Francisco Bay Area. She's also published Ashe, the newsletter of Black Lesbian Goings On in the Bay Area, and co-produced Sister Comrade, an event several years ago that celebrated the lives and friendship of Audre Lorde and Pat Parker. I so enjoyed talking with her in February of this year when we had a conversation to explore her work and her life. Her gift for collecting priceless pieces of history and history make her an invaluable person in our world where we so often disregard the things that remind us of who we are and from where we've come. My name is Lisbeth Tellefson, and uh, everything about me is a Bay Area, Northern Californian, um, politically, aesthetically. Um, I am a community archivist. I'm a, a publisher. I'm a producer. I am incredibly private, a little bit of a hermit. Yet everybody that knows me would swear I am out doing shit all the time. Oops, sorry. I have to edit that out. Did that get me explicit? I think I edited uh, yeah, that this out. is gonna be explicit, but it's fine. No, 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 all, all right, right, no, it's okay. Right. We we can do explicit. Okay, don't. It's fine. I don't want to censor you. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> there are uh, so many ways people can know you. I'm just glad that we have the chance to sit down and get to know you at the Zami Noble podcast today on this beautiful day in Oakland, California. Yeah, it is. Here in your home, in your office. And thank you. Oh, it is. It is a pleasure. You know, the older I get, um, you know, the more I recognize how important it is, you know, for each of us to tell our story. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my godfather, grandfather figure, who um, had a long activist life. You know, he died in his late 90s, but um, he had been a lifelong activist, close personal friends with folks like Langston Hughes and Paul Robeson. And in his 80s, he was getting frantic with trying to write his memoirs to get his story out. And um, he asked myself and a mutual friend of ours, Quayley, to do some oral histories. And we were just trying, trying, trying to get everything out while he was still here and we were unsuccessful. And, you know, that haunted me for years. It's like, how, how do you tell the story of you know, a a long life. Mm. How do you, you know, so I feel like as an archivist, you know, I'm obsessed with methodology for recording experiences and, you know, so, Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I'm not very good at because I'm really squirrely when it comes to sitting down in front of a microphone or in front of a camera is, telling my own story. You know, I can probably count on one hand the number of times that I've actually made myself available for that. So well done you. Nicely done. I'm just excited and so glad that we have the chance to sit down with you. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Um, so I am, I was born in San Francisco mm-hmm. and uh, 
have split my time between San Francisco and the East Bay. Um, you know, I spent my childhood in uh, West Berkeley, um, West North Berkeley, Albany area. Um, I spent my 20s in the Mission District in San Francisco. And the last uh, 20 some odd years, um, I've been back here in Oakland, which mm. now feels like home. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. Though I do regret not buying that duplex on South Van Ness for three ninety nine. dollars Okay, I'm not going to go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, go. Mm-hmm. Because a lot has changed in yeah. this area over the years. Yeah. And real estate uh, and other things, but a lot has changed. It's, uh, you know, the older I get, the more I really um, mourn the loss of the Bay Area that I knew and I've owned houses before. I've lost houses. I'm a homeowner now, but it's been a musical chairs situation. Mm -hmm. And the difference now between being an owner versus my friends who rent is the difference between being able to stay or just waiting for that letter, you know, that your rent's getting tripled Mm -hmm. and you have to go. So, yeah, it's really kind of sad. How has all of that affected the Bay Area scene with um, Black lesbians, uh, because you know this used to be such the the bed of of Black lesbian activity, and there's a long history uh, of Black lesbians out here doing incredible things. How has that shifted with all the things we've seen? So a couple of things. First, now I'm in my late fifties, and you know even the word Black lesbian is a vanishing culture, you know, lesbians in in general, Um, whereas especially in Oakland, we're very much a part of the fabric. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there doesn't exist that same type of tight knit community that there used to be. And because that community that does identify as black lesbian is, is aging, we have those issues of, you know, people disappearing health issues. Um, A lot of people have had to leave, Mm -hmm. you know, and basically go wherever they have some kind of ability to go. You know, when I go out, because I'm someone who over the decades has produced events and, and provided spaces for community building, I hear a lot, we need something like that again, we need some sort of structure that at least we get to plug in and be seen and connect with each other. And the thing about Ashe events back in the day is they were truly intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And there's just not that many spaces that offer that anymore. I mean, it seems to have gone back to club type of events, dance parties. Um, You know, it's also not so binary, used to be black and white. And Gratefully, it's not that. We are a whole freaking rainbow. And um, what I really wish there was a space for was intergenerational community building. Mm. Well, in this reality of uh, of a vanishing presence of of some of the things that that we took for granted in the area, let's talk a little bit about Ashe. And um, for those who don't know, tell us about the origins, what that was, and its lifespan in this area. Um, In terms of backstory, you mentioned that there's a lot of different ways that people see me. Mm -hmm. Um, In my life, I kind of have this way where when I open a chapter, I am just in it. It's all encompassing. And if you meet me, like, for example, people who knew me as a teenager would Mm -hmm. think I'm a tennis player and could not imagine Mm. a Lisbeth that didn't live on a tennis court. But when I turned the page, I put the racket down. Um, I was a musician. I was budding ethnomusicologist. I was completely immersed in Afro-Cuban music and culture. Mm -hmm. Um, My first major archive project was building a huge encyclopedia 
of material that was basically disseminated around the country, and it was a big moment in the mid-80s. Um, and people who know me from that time couldn't imagine that, <laughs> that I was not still doing that. Um, and sometime in the 80s, like one of my first partners was a, a performance poet named Storby Weber, and we spent a long time we spent a lot of energy while we were together trying to get her self-published. I had just gotten my first Mac and I was feeling omnipotent and I could create pages and things like that. And I can't even really remember if we were successful in getting the first one out, but I do remember that I was dabbling in early what they call desktop publishing. It was a new type of software application mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you could buy. And so I was learning how to use a Mac. I was dabbling in desktop publishing. And at the time, I was living on South Venice in the Mission, and I had started doing percussion workshops for a group called Sista Boom. San Francisco has a carnival parade. And I was in this group, um, a Brazilian group called Escola Nova de Samba. And I remember one day I was marching in the parade and behind me was like a hundred lesbians in a women's percussion ensemble. And I'm like, oh crap, I'm on the wrong team. So <laughs> yeah, I think the following... <laughs> The following year, I was in Sista Boom, and yeah, I was doing percussion workshops in my flat, and this woman, Pippa Fleming, came in, and she saw the tennis racket. She's like, you're a tennis player? I'm like, yeah. She's like, I'm a tennis player. So we started to play tennis together. So basically, we were hanging out, you know, all the time playing tennis, and I told her that I'd been dabbling in this desktop publishing thing. And we decided that we were going to produce a calendar of like just events. And because I was involved in like Afro Caribbean type events, the calendar kind of encompassed that community's events black events, women's events, gay events. And before we published, I, I hit up Stormy and I'm like, hey, um, you have some artwork and let's put a poem in there. And so, oh, and also I had started a business when I was 21, um, which was like publishing something like lists, to do with real estate. Mm -hmm. But the upshot was that I had a press room. I had a little AB Dick printing press. And so I thought I could print it myself. So I was like, oh, I'll just do it on my little Mac and then go print it up myself. Yeah, it took me one time to realize, okay, this is way too much work. We'll just go down to Kinko's and knock that out. So we published this issue and we called it Ashe a free journal for lesbians of African descent. And we made it a monthly. Mm. So a free monthly journal. So the first issue was, I think, eight pages with an insert. Within the first six months, it was like 44 pages. And so very quickly, um, it became clear that there was a hunger for this and people mm -hmm. were responding and, you know, we asked for a community submission, so we would get submissions of poetry, short stories, um, pretty much anything. Yeah, and then sometime after the, you know, before the beginning of the first year, Pippa decides she's moving to London. And I'm like, oh, crap, because um, she was kind of the person out on the streets, mm -hmm. you know, um, talking it up and interacting with people. And I was the one just stuck in front of the computer and upstairs at Kinko's. 
it was the first time we actually did a call out for support from the community. And some angels showed up. Um, Before Pippa left, she introduced me to a friend of hers, Sky Ward, who just became instrumental. She was, um, her job was something related to outreach. She basically became the person who took that on. By the end of the first year, we had a core committee, um, a great group of women who just kind of took on various aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Um, We published, I believe it was 27 issues between 1989, February 1989 was the first issue. And I think our last event was in 1995, but our last publication may have been in 1994. But very quickly, when we discovered that a free journal that went out monthly cost a heck of a lot of money, (laughs) we had the great idea, let's start doing some events. Mm. Our very first event was uh, Dr. Uh, Sheila S. Walker, who did a presentation on um, a group from Bahia, the Sisterhood of the Good Death. It's like Afro-Bahian women's group. And from there, we just started doing events. And almost immediately, the events became just as important, if not more, than the journal itself. Whereas at that time, you know, there were a lot of women that for whatever reason, weren't out. Mm -hmm. Um, The journal was something that they could, you know, subscribe to and read in the privacy of their own home. But the events became a place really for people to be together. And because, um, you know, in terms of uh, the era, in the Bay Area, you had the women's movement. And, you know, in the 70s, early 80s, um, there were organizations like Olivia Records, for example. So people like Linda Tillery, Gwen Avery, Mary Watkins, Vicki Randall, um, Pat Parker, these were the black women, right? So mm-hmm. when you thought black lesbian, you had five, six people, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And so when we came around as the next generation and we were calling ourselves a black lesbian organization, they were so glad to see us. You know, we could actually turn out a crowd that was 90% black, which I don't think they'd ever experienced in their life. So Pat Parker was a mentor the last year of her life, she devoted time to Ashe just because she really believed, you know, in what we were doing. And um, it kind of um, filled a local need. But what also became clear is that that era was a powerful moment Mm -hmm. in Black LGBT culture. Like, I liken it to the Harlem Renaissance, when Barbara Smith, you know, when Homegirls came out, you know, that was an earthquake. When Marlon Riggs' Tongues Untied came out, that was an earthquake. Um, Part of the uh, Shea events was working with a lot of upcoming filmmakers, like we screened early Cheryl Dunyer and Michelle Parkerson, and just a lot of these early works actually um, created a, a guide to Black, gay, and lesbian film. And I look at it now and it's like, dang, we practically have our own channels on Netflix or something. Yeah. So, yeah, it just felt at that time we were part of an incredible movement. And because we were, um, you know, a vehicle to disseminate information, Mm -hmm. globally, organizations would mail stories and things like this from South Africa, you know, so the earliest gay organizing happening in a lot of these countries, all of it would go through our pages. So I feel like my papers from that time were just a time capsule of such an important part of our history, you know? It's amazing because I hear you talk about this, um, earthquake of content 
that arose during the 80s and the 90s. And it seems like now there's just so much stuff out there that you really have to fight for people to get involved in some of the stuff that you're doing. And so we have all of this this great content, and yet you would imagine our visibility would be even more, but it's it's not. It's interesting to me just how we are having to kind of fight for space to uh, make certainly older Black lesbians more visible uh, and to have the type of of conversations that bring community, um, foster people uh, to be in relationship with organizations and just be in that space. It, it, it's interesting. I think part of that is the the internet. And so we're kind of galvanizing or, or getting into community in different ways. Uh, and that brings me to your other uh, piece that I wanted to talk about, or one of the other pieces is Sister Comrade, because I remember being in a place um, where I didn't have community, but there was this incredible event <laughs> that was going on in the Bay Area that had gone on, the Sister Comrade, and the content was available online. To me, that made a difference, just having access to information online. Um, and I think it would be important for people to have access to uh, these type of journals online. Mm. Is Ashe digitized at this point um, and available? No, but it's it's going to be done. You know, I have most of it digitized. I just haven't really put it up. You know, at this point, I think I gave a digital copy, a digital copy, I believe was included in my papers that went to Yale. Um, but I don't know that they're up anywhere. But as you can see today, I'm in the process of <laughs> digitizing old, old journals. And, uh, you know, I mean, to your point about um, us not finding um, that material, you know, the thing about the internet is that everything is so dispersed. I mean, literally, I think if somebody put up the black lesbian web page, you know, with links to all of this content that that would do the trick because it's all there. It's just, you know, I think we're drowning in content mm -hmm. and for younger people, you know, for the most part, content is disposable. You know, we see it, we consume it, we're on to the next. And for me, I think the point is how do we preserve this content? You know, how do we organize it? Do we curate it? Um, I just think, you know, there is, there is so much being produced right now that when people say they don't do this anymore, I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure somebody is doing that somewhere. You just have to find it. You know, I think also the black lesbian demographic is getting older and is maybe not so willing to go searching the internet for, for various things. So, you know, there probably is a role for someone to make that easier and more easy, you know, mm -hmm. easier to access. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, at the same time, I am somebody who at this point is just so buried in my own projects and in my own head. I'm I'm not really that sure of what's happening out there. It's just I meet people all the time who are producing events, who are publishing zines, who are doing podcasts. And so I know there's a heck of a lot of stuff out there. Um, it just maybe could be packaged or curated a little bit better I agree because I, I ran across a video on, on YouTube and it was probably from the eighties. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, this happens, you come across something on YouTube and it's really exciting and you want to make sure you bookmark it and post it on Facebook because there are these nuggets of information out there, but there's no, um, directory. Yeah. You know, like a well, dedicated yeah. portal or something. Yes. Like that. Yeah. Yes, yes. And then there's also this this whole idea of a lot of younger women not wanting to claim the term black lesbian or preferring to use the word queer. Um and I know with a lot of uh older black lesbians I've talked to that's been kind of disheartening 
because it seems as if it's a way of not keeping that memory or that lineage going. Erasure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I, I struggle with that also. You know, I do think, um, you know, how we self-identify is contextual. You know, we came up in an era, you know, like I remember um, when I came up, like our generation, we were kind of androgynous. And I freaked out the generation of women ahead of me who were like very butch femme. And that just evolves, Mm -hmm. you know, so am I queer? Yes. Do I still call myself a black lesbian? Yes. That's what feels natural to me. Um, The part that I push back against is lesbian, which to me is a culture, um, is being lost by the wayside when there is really generations of women that that is still valid in how they self-identify. And by erasing the term, you are erasing their history, culture, contributions. You know, I, I can't remember the event, but there was an event recently where it was supposed to be some umbrella celebratory event, and they just omitted the L altogether, you know? And you know, that a whole organizing committee could not see an issue with that. Mm. You know, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. When did you first come to know that you were a lesbian? You know, I, I would probably say that I always felt different. But, you know, that was in the context of my mother was not from this country. My mother was never an American citizen. She was a Norwegian citizen. So I was first generation. She was a single mom. Um, I was six feet tall by the time I was 13. (laughs) So I was pretty much always other biracial. Um, My parents were not married. So whatever it was, I was never cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. Like there was never a place that I was fitting in. So I always felt different. I don't know that I said the words that I'm gay to myself until, you know, maybe my senior year in high school, something like that. But I was also in the Bay Area. You know, by the time I came out to my friends, they're like, duh. (laughs) (laughs) My mother was fine with it. You know, I pretty much had a very easy coming out experience. But strangely enough, in retrospect, I remember it being like an aha moment when it should have been like a total gimme, but. Mm-hmm. Well, there are, there are two black lesbians I, I want to talk about next because they were the center of your sister comrade event, which I mentioned briefly. Tell us a little bit about how that event came to be. So, um, you know, maybe after the first or second issue of Ashe, we interviewed Pat Parker and she became kind of like a mentor, like she introduced us to people. And this was what would be the last six months of her life. But she was giving us time at at that stage. And um, I don't know who put us in touch with Audrey, but Audrey became someone who would use Ashe, like when they had a major hurricane that devastated St. Croix. We did care packages and sent books Mm. and things like that. And... um, She also uh, sent letters saying it's very important. She was in Germany getting her specialized cancer treatment in in Germany. And there was a whole Afro-German women's movement. And she's like, I want you guys to cross-pollinate. So we had an exchange where a group of Afro-German women came Um, Some stayed at my house, didn't leave. It was great. (laughs) Um, And then there was an exchange of women that went to Germany. So she was really excited. Um, I'll I'll show you the letter she wrote that kind of uses her own words. Mm. You know, we were involved in doing the work. That work was the 
uplifting of black lesbians everywhere and organizing more effectively and making connections, crossing bridges, that sort of thing. And when she died, um, a few of us did, um, I want to say the event was produced by myself, Jean Weisinger, maybe, and a woman named Haley. And we did an Audre Lorde Memorial. And we invited some women from Afro, some of the Afro-German women came over, um, Cherie Moraga. Yeah, it was just a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, we had a reprisal of the first reading of Movement in Black. We got um, five of the original women to come back. And so it was just, it was a great memorial. And gosh, 15 years later, something like that, I get a call from this woman, Haley, who who said, um, you know, Audrey's memorial is coming up. I would love, I would love to do another memorial to her. And I would also like to somehow include Pat Parker. She'd been Pat Parker's manager. And I had forgotten that when Pat had passed in 1989, her partner had asked for my help in gathering up, organizing Pat's papers. And she'd ended up, you know, giving me a key to the house. And whenever I had time, I would go and do some work in her file cabinet. And going through her papers, I found 20 years of correspondence between Pat and Audrey. I was I mean, I was blown away, everything from like little postcards with Bugs Bunny doodles. And I had asked Marty if she would let me, you know, I promised I won't do anything with them. Will you let me make a copy? Because this is priceless. And she said yes. And I'd forgotten all about it until Haley mentions she wants to do something with Pat and Audrey. And I'm like, whoa. I have 20 years of correspondence. Maybe we can do something. So I talked to the family to see if they'd let us use it. Yes, was their answer. And as we started to go through it, you know, we were like, well, if we could have a dream event, what would it be? So we envisioned this dialogue between Pat and Audrey. Um, Audrey's voice was Jewel Gomez. You know, they'd had a friendship. Um, Pat's voice was Linda Tillery, you know, who I think they were roommates or something at some point. And then we had all these important people like Blanche Wiesencook, who was maybe perhaps Audrey's best friend and her partner, Claire Koss, Sheree Moraga, early kitchen table press, Angela Davis, Holly Near. I think the only person who schedule didn't allow was Alice Walker. And I think she regretted it. And uh, yeah, Judy Gron and I sat down with all the letters and all the writings that they'd done referencing each other. And we came up with a dialogue. So this event was like the ultimate nod to black lesbian culture, Mm -hmm. their sisterhood. Um, Some of the stories, for example, one of the ones that I remember was Judy Gron, who was um, important poet and was part of the women's press movement. Um, Back in the day, women lived in communal houses and, and Judy told the story about her and her partner at the time, Audrey had been in town and Audrey was, you know, very self-contained West Indian, New Yorker. Um, and she wasn't really out in her work at that time. And so she tells the story about coming downstairs and it's clear that Pat and Audrey had been up all night hashing something out. And, you know, Pat looking like the cat that ate the canary because she had finally talked Audrey into coming out in her work. So these were the sorts of nuggets that Mm, came out in this event. 
it was just, it, it was perfect. And, you know, we've all had those moments where you're in a space and you recognize that you're experiencing something extraordinary yes, and, yes. and singular. And that's what Sister Comrade was. You know, for me, it was, you know, top five best nights of my life. Mm-hmm. I remember standing on the side of the stage with Vicki Randall. Wow. It was just like, wow. And somebody said something. And then Erica is sitting next to Angela Davis and they just like spontaneously get up and put their <laughs> hands in their head, like hands over their head, like Joe Montana. I'm like, this is marvelous. And if you could only imagine how uh, listeners um, listening to it in their home experienced that, because I was one such listener. And I remember there was a piece where um, there was a, a reading or, or a piece from Pat Parker talking about how um, Audre Lorde pushed her to be a better writer, more prolific in her writing. Uh, and I, I downloaded all of those MP3s that were made available on online because that was rich. And you're right. It was just such a a powerful experience, even if you weren't there, if you had access to that content. Yeah. It was amazing. That's the type of work that I get excited about because it makes us visible, but it also um, makes it possible for us to keep the memory alive. And I'm always concerned about the fact that uh, so many of our stories are not being kept alive in a way in which other people can feed off of them in the future. So you're also known as a collector and a curator. How did you begin this passion of collecting? So uh, a few years ago, a museum in San Francisco called MOAD, the Museum of the African Diaspora, did an exhibit based on collectors and their collections. And they asked me to do a collector's talk, which was really the first time I thought about my genesis, like how did I get here? And these may seem like random signposts, but one, where I where I grew up, it was West Berkeley, you know, all little ragamuffin kids. I think the whole block was single moms. But the very nearest store, like two blocks on the corner, the very first store was Berkeley's Hobby Shop. And it sucked up the allowance of every kid in a six block radius. So we all had comic book collections, baseball card collections, you know, that was just how we interacted. And because I have family who are international, mm-hmm. part of our ways of interacting were with our collections. It was our social currency. And so my godfather, grandfather figure, Matt Crawford, he was a community archivist. Every community, every generation has their keeper of the papers. Part of it, I think, is psychology. Erica, for example, could live like a Zen Buddhist minimalist in an empty room with a futon, whereas I always have stacks around me. So there is some psychological component um, where people assign value to things. Like, I think it's important to know what I did last year. You know, not everybody has that. Um, But I saw the the importance of holding history from an early age. So collecting, building collections, curating, which artifacts do I want to save, you know, became something that I actively did. And because my mother was the only one of her family that was in this country, I spent a lot of time on planes going to Norway and different countries where families lived. And because I didn't speak the language, I I often didn't remember what happened for the summer vacation. And I always had this little suitcase that I traveled with. And everywhere I went, everything I was dragged to, I would save the program or save the matchbooks or 
you know, somehow with the eye towards, I would get home, I would put them out on my bed, and I would put them in the order, and I could remember where I'd been. Mm -hmm. So the idea of using external objects as memory was something that I just started doing at a very early age. Mm. Yeah, as I got older, I I think I started collecting Latin vinyl. Like had an awesome <laughs> Cuban records, Fania, Latin music. I would have like DJs come into my house to make mixtapes. Wow. Like my first trip to Cuba in 1985, which was part of a group of musicians. I think I came back with 32 albums from Cuba. So my collections evolved over the years. And I think most consistently, I had settled on political posters. This first trip to Cuba again, I had um, come across of old revolutionary posters. And they were literally rotting in the humidity. And because I was a printer and I had been raised around graphic design. Not only did they appeal to me graphically, um, but, you know, the history was also really important. And um, the iconography struck me. I'm looking at Che Guevara, for example, where when you're raised in Berkeley, Che's image is as ubiquitous as Elvis and, you know, mm-hmm. Marilyn Monroe. Mm-hmm. But to see him, in Cuba, it was a completely different context. And so I just found it fascinating. So I started to collect political posters. This is also uh, a few years before eBay was started. So when eBay began, um, there was a dedicated group of us Cuban poster collectors that could now trade internationally. There's Steve in the UK, there's, you know, Mariana in Florida. And so I amassed a huge Cuban poster collection. One of my first dedicated exhibits was on Che Guevara posters that was called Beauty is in the Street. It started at Rutgers, Mason Gross Galleries, and then moved um, uptown to the Bronx River, River Arts Gallery. And Maybe in, gosh, 2003, 2004, I heard that there was a new book on Cuban posters being written, and we were all looking forward to that, only to find out that the author was in Berkeley. And then he's doing a book reading at Black Oak Books in Berkeley. So I'm like, oh, I go down, see this guy, Lincoln Cushing, with his cool beret on, and At the end of his talk, he introduces a guy in the audience and has him stand up. His name is Michael Rossman, and he thanks him for letting him use his 25,000 poster collection as the basis of his book. And at this point, I have a few hundred posters and really cannot fathom how somebody is managing a collection Mm -hmm. of 25,000 unless they live in some airplane hangar. So I introduce myself. He invites me over to see how he does it. And um, I'm looking at his collection, which is really a singular national resource. I'm like, this is treasure, man. Have you thought about digitizing it? And he's like, well, Link and I have been digitizing part of it for years, but we could really use some help. And we started something we called the Political Poster Portal which was the three of us digitizing our respective collections. And to make it exciting for me, they said, let's start with the Angela Davis posters. And I'm like, hey, you know, at this point, you know, as a Bay Area girl, Mm -hmm. I had a few Panther and some Angela Davis posters, but I said, works for me. So I think between the three of our collections, we maybe had 50 Angela Davis posters. And after we shot the archival Kodachrome slides, my job was to get the get them processed and then at that point ship them off to Canada to get them digitized. And I will never forget getting back these CDs, popping them in my computer, 
and watching 50 Angela Davis posters tile across my screen. Wow. You know, in this day and age with Google Images, you know, it's nothing to see a thumbnail gallery, but I was like, it it was revelatory at Mm. the time. Mm. And because computers back then, it was hard to have that many images open. Mm -hmm. Um, I popped for the expensive color Xerox, which was like a buck each back in the day. And I printed out each file and I just put them in a page protector and a binder so I I could at least look at them easily. And over the years, as digitization caught hold, I began to realize that, oh, some of the old newspaper archives, like the New York Times and whatnot, are making their archives available. I bet some of these Angela Davis events, I bet I can find an article on it. So I started to print out those stories and put them interspersed between the posters in chronological order. Then newspapers started to become less relevant. Right. And some of the larger newspapers started to liquidate their photo morgues, all their newswire photographs were now being sold off and nobody seemed to be noticing. So I purchased all the Black Panther, the Malcolm X, the Angela Davis. I got thousands of Newswire photographs and digitized those and started to add them into these binders. So where are you housing all all of this you're I'm surrounded by all of this amazing work. Wow. And they're in like bins. Is that how you, the best way to preserve them? You know, some are slip covered binders, some are century box D ring albums. Um Wow. Yeah. I mean, not everything is here, but you know, literally uh, hundreds of posters, thousands of photographs. Um, hundreds of publications, pamphlets, periodicals. So our ephemera. listeners need to understand that you are well organized, and this <laughs> this is I, this is impressive because everything is outlined in this space uh, and seems to have its own place. So what's all here? So there's different projects right now. I'm working on um, an Angela Davis exhibit. Um, this will be the largest to date. It's um, centered around Angela Davis. Um, It will be centered around my archive, though there will be pieces commissioned from other groups relating to it. Um, So you have the things that have been pulled that are getting ready to be shipped for the exhibit. Um, You know, this is only one of my places. Right now I have the Angela Davis stuff in here because it's the center of this current project. Um, but there's a Black Panther archive, there's a Black LGBT archive, though most of that lives elsewhere. Um, my poster collection, I'm in, I'm in the process of cataloging things. So yeah, there's a lot of everything everywhere. Wonderful. Wonderful. I have a couple of questions to ask you. Uh Uh-huh. The first is you you mentioned Erica, the name Erica. Oh, yes. Um, a few uh, minutes ago. Tell us how you all met. And for our listeners who don't know, Erica Huggins is your partner. How did you all meet? So it's about 15 years ago, I guess. Um, at the time, I was one of the organizers of what we called the East Bay Dyke March. It was called Sister Steppin' and Pride, ran for 10 years in Oakland, and It was a dyke march and festival that really has not been replicated in the Bay Area. It was just one of these days where, like, totally intergenerational, like, it was just a beautiful day in Oakland. And at some point, uh, somebody had asked Erica to participate somehow in the festival and I don't remember the whole story, but it got boogered up somehow. And, you know, I didn't know Erica, though we had friends in common. 
And I was just, you know, kind of bummed out that we didn't get that right. And that she might have some feeling about us not having our shit together. So the day before the festival, I'm, I'm driving and I just decide I'm going to call her in person to apologize for it not going as smoothly as it should have. And I remember, say, you know, introducing myself and, you know, just saying, you know, I hope, I hope we didn't leave a bad taste in your mouth. I'm sorry that we weren't as organized as it should be. And she's like, well, I'm glad you called because I had a few things to say. <laughs> I literally, I had to pull over. I still remember the stop sign. Because <laughs> instead of just like a little like 30 second okie doke call, mm -hmm. I had to like listen to it. And I was like, okay, all right, okay. And I think I impressed her that I listened to it or something. I don't know. But um. It was either Vicki Randall or Melanie Demore, two local artists, were performing at a club, and I had a. It was Vicki Randall, and I had a. Um, I had an extra ticket, and I said, "Well, um, can I offer you some tickets to go see Vicki Randall?" And somehow we ended up going together, and you know just. There was lots of time to talk in line and, you know, we just kind of hit it off. And um, the next day I took um, a CD from the event and ran up to Vicky's to get it autographed and I dropped it off to her. And I guess that was the move. I guess that was my move. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we've been together ever since. Like We're going on 14, 15 years, something like that. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that uh, story with us and those memories, um, being the keeper of memories that you are. <laughs> That's right. Um, I always ask my guests before we close, is there something we forgot? Is there a piece of information? Is there a memory that you think would be important for our listeners to know? <sighs> That's a good question, and it'll probably come to me at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess, as I said when we started or before we started, you never know which Lisbeth you're going to get. Chatty Lisbeth or like monosyllabic Lisbeth. And clearly you got Chatty Lisbeth. And uh, I think there's lots more stories and there's lots of pieces of our life. And I just really appreciate anybody that's doing work to really, you know, document that we were here. I mean, oftentimes when I'm working in collections or helping people build their, their papers, you know, I'm not thinking about somebody two years from now. I'm thinking about somebody 50 years from now opening that box and really recognizing, oh my gosh, what a remarkable treasure trove of history that I'm going to get to dive in. Yeah, I guess one thing I, I would like to say is that all of us have a piece in history. We all have stories or an artifact or something that has value in the future. And to whatever extent that we can make sure our journals survive, make sure our snapshots of our house parties, you know, I would kill right now for snapshots from house parties and write people's names on the back, stuff like that. Mm. Um, this is something we all need to understand is really important. And if we don't want to be erased from history, not only do we need to make sure that we save our history, but also that it gets somewhere that we'll be able to take care of it in perpetuity. Elizabeth, keeper of memories. Thank you no, for being part of said. our Black Lesbian history. Pleasure. I told you that Lisbeth was a D, all of the above woman. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lisbeth. I hope her story has inspired you to think about the ways in which you collect all that information around you. And perhaps you will negotiate some space 
in a cardboard box in a safe place where you can make sure you're preserving your memorabilia, your life's record appropriately. And maybe during this time, you will be encouraged to keep a journal, take some pictures, do some audio recordings of what life is like in 2020. So that when we're beyond this, we'll have a receipt of how we have lived our days. My friends, I appreciate your listening to the podcast and hope that you will return again. But wherever you do listen, leave a comment, give some feedback. In the meantime, be safe and have a sweet one. Mm-hmm.